Um, welcome. Uh, welcome to this program on the basics of Medicare. Uh, on behalf of Senator Rockefeller and our board of directors, uh, we're very pleased to have you here. We're very pleased to be on the House side for the first time in about five years, and so there are some logistical differences, those of you who are regulars, and I, uh, I would appreciate you bearing with us. We were worried that the room was so uh, long relative to its width that you wouldn't be able to see us, but since the chairs are so short, you can't see us anyway. <laughs> so don't worry about that. Just look at the screen, and the slides will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, we're here to talk about Medicare. Uh, Medicare is the largest solely federal health program, it covers 45 million people or so, uh, at a cost this year well north of half a trillion dollars. It was enacted in 1965. I came to work on the Hill in 1970, and I can't remember the last year that Congress didn't pass some legislation uh, substantially affecting this huge and popular and expensive program that delivers health care uh, to elderly and disabled Americans. Uh, so there's a need for everybody in the policy process to understand how Medicare works. Plus, as you all know, there were some substantial changes to Medicare enacted as part of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and we'll hear some uh, expert observations about those changes as well today. Our partner and co-sponsor in this briefing is the Kaiser Family Foundation. You'll hear from Tricia Newman in just a moment. Um, in fact, why don't we do that right now? Uh, Tricia Newman is the vice president of Kaiser Family Foundation and director of its Medicare policy project. Tricia. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, everybody, for coming today to do Medicare 101 boot camp, as we call it, but we hope it won't be as painful as boot camp. Um, we're having this program because Medicare is never far from national policy discussions, so it's an issue that you and your bosses can never get too far from. Um, that's true because Medicare is now 15% of the federal budget. But it's also true because it's an important source of coverage for our parents, our grandparents, and hopefully one day for us. So we think a lot about Medicare, and uh, healthcare providers think a lot about Medicare, and plans think a lot about Medicare. And in some ways, we take Medicare for granted. But as Ed said, Medicare was enacted in 1965, um, before I was working on the Hill, too. Um, but at the time, half of all seniors lacked health insurance coverage. And I think in this day and age, we take for granted how easy it is for older people to get health insurance coverage. And that's such an important function of the Medicare program. So as we all know, Medicare ended up playing a fairly important role in the health reform law and was a major part of discussions, towards, particularly toward the end. And as we'll soon hear, Medicare could pop back on the front burner of discussions um, if and when Congress gets, um, gets down to work for real on the federal budget uh, deficit. So that's all the more reason, we think, to step back and to sort of regroup and learn more about the ABCs and Ds of Medicare, which is exactly what we're going to do today. Um, we have a really great session for you, we think. We're going to focus on Who's covered by Medicare? How does Medicare pay plans and providers? What are some of the great issues of the day that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are dealing with with respect to Medicare? And then we're going to turn to the future challenges facing the program. So without further ado, I'll turn it back to Ed. I will say this is your chance to get the basics. Feel free to ask basic questions. If you don't want to stand up at the mic, send them in on paper. This is, this is your time, and we have great experts for you right up here on the panel. Hey, thank you, Tricia. Uh, you also have some good information about Medicare in your packets. There's also a set of biographical sketches that will provide a lot of information about our panelists beyond what I'll have the opportunity to say. Uh, some of you may be watching the webcast of this. We have made a particular effort to make it available to state and district offices uh, of members of Congress. 
And for those of you who are doing that, you can find all of these materials, including the biographical sketches and the, and the slide presentations of those who have them, uh, at the Alliance website, which is allhealth.org. Um, in a couple, I guess by Monday, you can uh, watch this webcast, those of you in the room, and download a podcast if you uh, have nothing else to do on your ride in in the morning. Um, as Tricia noted, there are green question cards in your packets. You can use them at the appropriate time, and microphones uh, to which you can repair to ask the question yourself. And uh, as the lady said, without further ado, we do have a terrific panel. Let's let them talk. And the first one of those terrific people is Julia Kubansky. She's the Associate Director of the Medicare Policy Project for the Foundation and an expert on Medicare financing issues and an expert on the Part D prescription drug benefit. She holds a doctorate in health policy from Harvard. Her task today is to give us the broad overview of this important program, and it's great to have you set the stage for us, Julia. Thank you, Ed and Tricia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ed said, I'm Juliet Kubansky, um, Associate Director of Medicare Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at Kaiser who work on Medicare policy, along with myself and Tricia, uh, Gretchen Jacobson, Jennifer Huang, and Lindsay Dawson. So my role here is to provide you with some essential facts about Medicare, who the program serves, what benefits are covered, and a current profile of Medicare spending and financing. As Tricia said, Medicare was established in 1965 to provide health insurance coverage to people age 65 and older, and was expanded in 1972 to cover younger people with permanent disabilities. Today, Medicare covers 48 million people, 40 million under age 65, and 8 million people with disabilities. Medicare covers people without regard to their income or their medical history and provides the same defined benefits to everyone entitled to Medicare coverage. This is an important feature of Medicare that distinguishes it from Medicaid and private health insurance. Medicare provides access to services critical to the health of the elderly and people with disabilities, including hospital and physician visits and a prescription drug benefit delivered through private plans, which have been playing an increasingly larger role in delivering Medicare benefits in recent years. Is this, I don't even know which slide I'm on because I can't see. It's there the we go. Thank okay. you. Medicare covers a population with diverse needs and circumstances, one which on the whole tends to be sicker and have greater health needs than others. Close to half have three or more chronic conditions, and three in 10 have a cognitive or mental impairment. The oldest beneficiaries, those age 85 and older, are about 12% of all people on Medicare, but as the US population ages, they will be representing a larger share of the Medicare population in the future. Many beneficiaries live on modest incomes, primarily derived from Social Security, with, with um, almost half having annual income less than 200% of the federal poverty level, which is around $22,000 for a single person in 2011. And a small share of beneficiaries live not in their homes or other community settings, but in long-term care facilities where they use services at a higher rate than other people on Medicare, reflecting their more fragile health status. For the majority of beneficiaries, Medicare benefits are provided on a fee-for-service basis, referred to as original or traditional Medicare. Benefits for hospital and physician services are divided into two parts, Part A and Part B. Part A is the hospital insurance program, which helps pay for hospital visits and skilled nursing stays, post-acute home health care, and hospice care. Medicare charges a deductible before it begins paying for a hospital stay, which is just over $1,100 this year and also charges for each day of an extended stay in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility, but there's no cost to beneficiaries for home health care. Part B is the supplementary medical insurance program, which covers physician visits, um, outpatient hospital services, and preventive services such as mammograms and flu shots. Most beneficiaries enrolled in Part B pay um, monthly premium, which is $115 in 20, uh, 2011. But this premium is income related, meaning that higher income people pay a higher monthly Part B premium. 
Part B services are subject to deductible and may also be subject to coinsurance of 20%. Typically, people gain entitlement to Medicare Part A after paying payroll taxes for at least 10 years and enroll when they turn 65. Enrollment in Part B is voluntary, but the majority of people who are entitled to Part A also enroll in Part B. There is a penalty for delayed enrollment in Part B, however, unless a person has another source of coverage. Part C and Part D, which I'll talk about next, are different from original fee-for-service Medicare because they involve the delivery of benefits through private plans. Part C, known as Medicare Advantage, offers an alternative to fee-for-service Medicare where beneficiaries can enroll in a private plan, such as an HMO or a preferred provider organization. These plans contract with Medicare and receive payments from the government to provide enrollees with all of their Medicare-covered benefits and often extra benefits that Medicare does not cover, such as vision and dental services. According to the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, Medicare pays more for people enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans, about 9% more on average, than if those same individuals were covered under original Medicare. This payment system has received a great deal of attention in recent years. As a result of the health reform law, there are changes ahead as to how plans will be paid, which I believe John will be talking more about. But suffice it for me to say that in recent years, this payment system has driven a dramatic expansion of Medicare enrollment um, and Medicare plan availability since 2005. As of February 2011, nearly 12 million people, a quarter of all of those on Medicare, are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans. The Part D benefit that started in 2006 represented another large expansion of private plans in Medicare. Part D is a voluntary outpatient prescription drug benefit delivered through private plans, either standalone drug plans or Medicare Advantage plans that offer drug coverage. Beneficiaries in each state have the option to enroll in more than dozens of standalone Part D plans and Medicare Advantage drug plans. Plans are required to offer a standard benefit, which is depicted on this slide, with a deductible, a 25% coinsurance uh, for prescriptions, followed by a gap in coverage, followed by catastrophic protection for high drug costs. Plans can vary the design of the standard benefit, and in fact, most plans offer an alternative design that is actuarially equivalent. This gap in coverage is commonly referred to as the donut hole. Um, this is where, until this year, beneficiaries were, were responsible for paying 100% of the cost of their uh, drugs until their spending reaches catastrophic levels. As a result of the health reform law, this gap is gradually closing between now and 2020. This year, beneficiaries are responsible for paying 50% of the cost of their brand drugs and 93% of the cost of generics in the gap. Those with modest income and assets are um, eligible for additional assistance with Part D premiums, and nearly 10 million people are currently receiving this extra help. And in total, nearly 90% of beneficiaries now have drug coverage, with a majority having coverage through a Part D plan. The cost of providing all of these benefits has risen, along with rising health care costs. And in 2010, Medicare benefit payments totaled $509 billion. Presently, inpatient hospital services comprise the largest share of payments at 27%, followed by payments to Medicare Advantage plans and Part B benefits. Um, and then spending on the Part D drug benefit. Revenues to pay for these benefits come from several different sources. Part A is funded primarily through payroll taxes. These revenues, uh, from which the Part A trust fund derived 85% of its revenue in 2010, are a dedicated pack tax paid both by employers and employees. Part B and Part D are financed primarily through a combination of general revenues and premiums paid by beneficiaries. Part C, Medicare Advantage, is not shown here because its benefits are not financed um, separately. Despite the important benefits that Medicare covers, there are gaps in the Medicare benefit package. Medicare does not cover vision or dental services nor does it pay for most long-term care services for those beneficiaries with extended care needs in a nursing home. Medicare also has premiums and cost-sharing requirements that could prove burdensome for beneficiaries on limited incomes. 
and has deductibles for Part A, Part B, and Part D, which added together make Medicare look something like a high deductible insurance plan. And unlike typical large employer plans, Medicare does not have a stop loss benefit that limits how much beneficiaries have to spend out of pocket in any one year, which is a concern because our research shows that health spending by people on Medicare as a share of their incomes has been rising in recent years from 11.9% in 97 to 16.2% uh, in 2006. And average spending on premiums and cost sharing for Part B and Part D together consume more than 25% of the average Social Security benefit, which is about $1,100 per month. So with Medicare paying less than half of beneficiaries' total health and long-term care spending, many beneficiaries have some form of additional insurance coverage to help with their out-of-pocket expenses and provide additional benefits. The primary source of supplemental coverage for one in three beneficiaries comes from employer-sponsored retiree health benefits. But it's of some concern that employer-sponsored retiree coverage has been eroding in recent years, along with the rising cost of offering retiree coverage. Medicare Advantage is another main source of supplemental coverage, supplemental in the sense that these plans often cover benefits that Medicare, uh, original Medicare does not cover. And finally, uh, pr private insurance policies known as Medigap primarily help cover Medicare cost sharing for um, deductibles and coinsurance, but premiums for these policies are often quite expensive. And last, but by no means least, um, Medicaid provides a vital source of support for more than 8 million Medicare beneficiaries with low incomes who are known as dual eligibles. Most of these receive full coverage um, for the Medicaid benefits, um, including long-term care, as well as um, substantial assistance paying for their Medicare cost sharing and premiums. But I should also note that not all low-income people are covered by Medicaid. Um, this leaves roughly one in 10 beneficiaries with original Medicare and no other source of supplemental, encourage, uh, supplemental insurance, which could focus attention in the coming years on the adequacy of the Medicare program, um, the benefits it offers, and ways to bolster um, and improve those benefits. But what I think most of us will probably be focusing on in the immediate future are uh, the changes brought about in Medicare as a result of the Affordable Care Act. I know you'll be hearing more about these changes from some of the other speakers, but let me just give you a brief overview. The law includes several benefit improvements, including, as I mentioned, phasing out the coverage gap and eliminating cost sharing for prevention services. The law also includes reforms designed to help improve the quality of care for people on Medicare and the efficiency of the delivery system. And the law includes provisions estimated to bring about major savings to Medicare including lower payments to Medicare Advantage plans, hospitals, and other types of providers, as well as bringing in new revenues. The net effect of all of these provisions is lower Medicare spending over the next decade and 12 additional years of solvency of the Part A trust fund. So while you may be hearing that Medicare faces serious long-term financial challenges, it's also important to understand that the health reform law took some important steps to improve Medicare's financial outlook, as well as the coverage that 48 million people on Medicare receive. So on that note, I'll turn it back to you, Ed. Great. Thanks very much, Juliet. Excellent start to this discussion. Next, we welcome back to these briefings Dr. Bill Scanlon. Bill's a consultant to the National Health Policy Forum. He's a former member of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, and he spent more than a decade uh, as a senior healthcare official at GAO. I don't want to say what, it, what, what GAO stands for because it's different then and now. Uh, he's an economist, and he's here to tell us how Medicare pays for that half a trillion dollars worth of services it buys each year. Bill, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think this is going to be a bit like a reduced Shakespeare Company's version of Medicare payment policy. <laughs> um, though there's probably two differences. One, I'm not going to cover every play. I can't get every payment system sort of in in, within the 10 minutes. Um, and secondly, there will be no humor. Um, <laughs> okay. Fits right in. Okay. Um, I wanted to start by just um, acknowledging the, something I'm sure that you all know, which are the objectives of Medicare payment policy. 
One, to assure access for beneficiaries. Secondly, to encourage efficiency. And third, third to accommodate and now sort of to think about promoting quality. I raise these because these are very much in, were very much in mind in terms of the design of policies, and they're very much in the minds of MedPAC um, every year when it makes recommendations to the Congress about what should happen in terms of the changes in policy. The first two have been, been traditionally part of the program, um, and part of the thinking about in terms of payment policy with respect to the program. The third, we're in a state evolutionary stage. We've gone from being concerned about whether there was enough money being paid to providers to assure that they could have quali provide quality care to a system where we're thinking about how can we actually encourage them to provide higher quality care. This is very much a work in progress. I'm not going to touch on it more, but maybe John or, or Mark will. will um, and um, we can talk about that sort of in the question and answer period. The context for Medicare payment policy co goes back to 1965, where the law says Medicare shall not interfere with the practice of medicine. Two of the sort of consequences of that are that Medicare is essentially an any willing, able provider program, um, so that you need to deal with sort of almost all of the providers that, are, that want to participate in the program. Secondly, there's been a tradition of maintaining beneficiary freedom of choice. These are both issues in terms of how you set payment rates. A third factor to think about is the size of the program. Sort of as, you, as you've heard, this is a very large program which has both pluses and minuses. On the plus side is it has the leverage to say, here are prices, um, are you interested in participation, and you're going to get sort of good participation. Um, on the negative side, it is how you set those prices, it's very difficult to look at markets and to get sort of information from providers in order to be able to set the, the price because Medicare distorts the market. There's no sort of question about that. As a result of this context and, and some of the dilemmas with it, we've ended up with sort of payment policies that you could put into two categories. The first category being the traditional program's administrative prices, prices that the Medicare program sets and publishes and, and then says, if you want to participate in the program, here's the price that we're going to pay. Of more recent vintage is an attempt to use competition to set prices. And this goes back on, on a wide scale to 2003 with the Medicare Modernization Act, where we introduced competitive processes within Medicare for both Medicare Advantage um, and the Part D sort of drug benefit. Again, sort of given the size of the program, sort of how you capture the benefits of competition becomes challenging, and I'll talk about that sort of a bit later. Um, with respect to sort of administered prices, I want to start with sort of the physician fees because they actually are going to be probably very prominent sort of in your, uh, in your lives sort of over the course of the next year. Ed mentioned earlier that um, virtually every year there's Medicaid, Medicare legislation. It's the physician fees that are probably driving the need for Medicare legislation because of the sustainable growth rate, um, the pending reduction sort of in fees due to the sustainable growth rate, and your need sort of to make sure that that doesn't sort of happen. Um, we started sort of back in 1965 sort of with respect to physicians paying reasonable charges. Um, we turned out it wasn't reasonable at all. Um, that what ended up being sort of was a very inflationary system with a lot of sort of variation that was not rationally related to quality of care, sort of the appropriateness of care at all. And so we tried to move to a system that pays sort of more sort of rationally. That system is the Medicare physician fee schedule or the relative value-based um, fee schedule. Um, the fees are based upon relative values that were designed, derived first from a Harvard study of the differences in the resources that it takes to provide an individual service. Um, and have since been that Harvard study in the 80s have been updated by an American Medical Association committee called the Resource Utilization Review Committee. Um, what these values do is they measure the relative differences between two different services in the amount of physician time that's involved in the delivery of that service, as well as the intensity of that physician's involvement. Secondly, sort of the practice expenses involved with the service, which includes other, other staff in a physician's office, um, supplies, equipment, sort of, and rent. Um, and finally, sort of the cost of malpractice insurance. Um, to give you an example, sort of an office visit, they'll have a relative, uh, an intermediate office visit will have a relative value of two. Um, 
and some arthroscopic surgery on a knee will have a relative value of about 18. There's 7,000 different relative values, 7,000 plus different relative values reflecting the 7,000 sort of different um, procedures. To get to the fee that um, a Medicare pays, you take the relative value for a service, multiply it sort of by um, a conversion factor and adjust it for the geographic area that a service is being performed in um, to reflect differences in the cost of living across areas. The conversion factor was originally done in a budget neutral way in 1989 when we started the fee schedule. And then it has been updated through a process either, first of all, related to something similar to the sustainable growth rate. And since sort of the sustainable growth rate was enacted in 1997, the sustainable growth rate or the congressional override <laughs> of the sustainable growth rate, okay? Um, the conversion factor today is $34, roughly. Um, and, we, and then, as I said, it's, there's a geographic adjustment, which there are 89 areas for geographic adjustment um, that, that um, sort of determine the actual fee being paid. Why do we have a sustainable growth rate? We have a sustainable growth rate because there's a big issue in terms of Medicare cost with respect to the volume and intensity of services that we wanted to create an incentive to try and encourage physicians to be efficient in terms of the services that they provide. To give you an example of sort of how we have not succeeded there, over the last 10 years, Medicare fees have increased 12% over a 10-year period. Medicare spending per beneficiary has increased 77% over that same sort of period of time. We have a very significant volume and intensity problem. The sustainable growth rate appeared to be working until about 2002 when there was a need to reduce fees by about 5%, um, at, which was due to the fact that, fee, that services were growing faster and we had some data errors that we were correcting. Um, the problem is that that 5% that then triggered sort of a series of projected changes um, in the physician fees that were all negative um, and which every year the Congress has overridden. The cumulative effect is we are now, as you know probably very well, facing a minus 25 percent change in physician fees unless there is congressional action. Let me go on now to sort of some to Part A services, which um, are very often paid under what I'll call the prospective payment model. It's the same kind of uh, payment model for hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, home health, um, as well as some other services. What happens is that the payments are determined by looking at sort of data that are available to Medicare and calculating the cost per unit of payment. Um, adjusting that for differences in the types of patients that are receiving a particular service and then applying sort of a geographic sort of adjuster. Um, one of the key things here is that, th that these payments are then updated every year based upon either what's in statute, um, which often says we're going to adopt, update these, these payments with inflation, um, or get my other modifi uh, modified in other ways. Every year, MedPAC gives you a set of recommendations about sort of what those other modifications sort of might entail. This chart, which you can look at later, gives you a sense of sort of the, how, how for individual services this model for prospective payment is applied. Um, there's two things I would sort of note about this as we move forward when we're th thinking about sort of the Affordable Care Act. One of the concepts in the Affordable Care Act is the notion that we can improve efficiency through bundling. The prospective payment systems in some ways have already taken us down the road towards bundling. Hospital, in hospitals, we went from itemizing every service to paying for a, so a total stay. The same thing with respect to sort of home health. With a skilled nursing facility, we don't itemize every, every item anymore, but we do still pay on a daily basis, but that's still somewhat more of a bundle than we paid sort of for in the past. The hospital case, in the hospital case, I, feel, I think we feel like we have been successful for the most part, um, that the bundling worked. In home health, I would say that it'd be hard to find people that would say this bundling works because we realize that we've, create, we've created a bundle where we don't have a concept of what belongs in it, we don't have a concept of whether we got what we're supposed to be paying for, and as a result, we've been watching sort of about 500 new agencies form every year um, to take advantage sort of of the home health sort of um, payment system. Let me now turn to competitive uh, we determined payments, and as I said, it's for Medicare Advantage and Part D plans, um, and then we'll talk a little bit later about durable medical equipment, which we're starting sort of right now. In these plan in competitively determined payment payments, the plans themselves are determining sort of how much is being paid 
Um, but in tr using competition, you have to give somebody an incentive to compete, okay? You have to sort of t to tell them sort of that here's what it takes to be a winner, and you, they have to be motivated to do that, okay? The way we've chosen to motivate them in the, these two instances is to say, we're going to have benchmarks, you're going to bid against this benchmark, and the lower you bid relative to that benchmark, the, lar the larger the market share you're likely to get, okay? In the case of Medicare Advantage plans, the benchmark has been set by the program using information from the fee-for-service uh, experience with fee-for-service or traditional Medicare program or from using floors that the Congress has established. The floors created, have created a situation that Juliet referred to in terms of the, how much Medicare payments may, for Medicare Advantage plans may exceed sort of the traditional cost of traditional Medicare. The floors in some counties um, can be as high as 130 to 150 percent of fee for service. So a plan in those counties is bidding against a benchmark that is much higher than fee for service, and even though they bid lower than the benchmark, they still cost more than the traditional program, and they're still able because there's a requirement that when you bid lower, you're going to get a share of that money that between the benchmark and your bid that the Medicare program is going to pay you and you're going to have to give that to beneficiaries in the form sort of of extra benefits. Um, as Juliet has indicated, sort of the, there are significant changes to the Medicare Advantage system, payment system sort of pending in, uh, the, in future years due to the Affordable Care Act. And I'm going to let John sort of talk maybe more about those. Um, but I do have a slide that you can look at in your package um, to um, understand sort of or look at some of the details sort of of those changes. Let me now sort of turn to the latest sort of change, significant change in Medicare payment, which is durable medical equipment. Um, for years we've known um, that durable medical equipment was being overpaid by significant amounts, for, and it's not sort of hard to understand in part. We were basing most of our fees on 1986 charges trended forward for inflation. Um, and with tech, all technologies, as we all know that we, when we buy it, that it, they often become cheaper over time instead of sort of more expensive, and yet we're using sort of historical fees to sort of pay for these. So the Congress has instituted a competitive bidding program for durable medical equipment, which is being rolled out this year, I think, in 11 areas for a limited number of products. This is a different form of competition because this competition does involve sort of a different incentive for um, bidding low, and that is that you can actually lose the contract. You may not be able to provide services to Medicare beneficiaries if you have bid sort of too high. The way that CMS designed this, though, in my, my view, is that they've made a lot of accommodations to both pervert, preserve some freedom of choice um, as well as to protect small businesses. Now, I've seen as a result, and potentially because of these accommodations to two important goals, both criticisms that we're both being too aggressive or not aggressive enough in terms of, of durable medical equipment pricing. The reality is we're moving away from a very bad system to something that's a significant improvement. In the first round, we've seen 30 percent reductions in the fees that are going to be paid for these services. The key, sort of, I mean, I, the key to all of these payment systems is vigilance. We've discovered that sort of through at MedPAC over the years that you have to be vigilant in terms of monitoring what's happening under a system, making sure that you have sort of current data and that you're using those current data because this process of setting fees for literally thousands and thousands of services um, is incredibly challenging and, and there's a lot of effort need to needs, needed for, to maintain a reasonable set of prices. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Before we go on, could you just uh, lay out what what the, the main things you're talking about when you refer to durable medical equipment. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you, I will tell you sort of what the, the items that are being competitively bid, which maybe sort go. of as a help. Um, it's oxygen and oxygen supplies, power wheelchairs um, and scooters, um, diabetic supplies that, that come through mail order, um, enteral nutrition um, services, hospital beds, and walkers. Um, it also includes all kinds of other supplies um, like um, catheters and canes and um, actually canes I think are, with, are in the walker group too. So it's, so it's things like that in terms of durable medical equipment. Great. Question. Okay, thank you. Um, next we're going to hear from Jonathan Blum. He is the Deputy Administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and head of CMS's Center for Medicare. 
Uh, he's responsible for everything you like and everything you hate <laughs> about the vast Medicare program. Uh, he's done a stint at OMB. He's been on the staff of the Senate Finance Committee. He was at Avalier Health just before coming to CMS, and we're very pleased, John, to have you on our panel. Great. Well, thank you, Ed, and thank you, Tricia, and uh, thank you. I think this is my third opportunity being at this forum uh, during my time at CMS. And just to let folks know where I sit within the organization, so I sit over the Center for Medicare, which oversees the payment systems, which sets benefits, sets payment levels to all the fee-for-service providers uh, that Bill and Juliet uh, discussed, and also our, our payment rules and regulations for our uh, private plans, the Medicare Ad Advantage and Part D plans uh, that participate within Medicare. I think it's important to note that the work at CMS that, that ties to the Medicare program expands beyond the center that I oversee. Um, there are separate centers for program integrity, uh, separate centers for financial management, uh, survey and cert, quality oversight, um, the, the new center for innovation that was created with the Affordable Care Act. So when we talk about Medicare and CMS, there's lots of organizations uh, that, that, that touch the program, but the world where I come from at CMS is about the benefits that are paid for and, and the payment systems um, that, that, that are used to pay providers and uh, to um, pay plans. Wanted to kind of um, offer a few remarks um, um, and, and then happy to answer questions during the Q&A session, uh, but really wanted to talk about some of the work that, we, that, that we've done in the last year and are doing this year uh, to, to implement new payment systems and also to implement many of the provisions uh, that are in the Affordable Care Act. And I think the first thing is just to point out that in starting this year, January 1st, 2011, this year, there are better benefits to our minds for, for Medicare beneficiaries. The Affordable Care Act uh, to us uh, changed the program in uh, two important ways. Uh, one is to really shift the nature of the program more towards prevention and, and wellness. Uh, starting this year, uh, beneficiaries um, uh, uh, now have free cost sharing that are in the, the traditional fee-for-service program uh, for those uh, preventive benefits um, that are that are recommended. And also, there's, there's a brand new wellness visit that beneficiaries have the right to to receive each year. And while it sounds obvious for folks who are in you know, the kinds of health plans we're all in, you know, for the Medicare program, uh, this is a tremendous change and hopefully a uh, strong change uh, for the better for our beneficiaries. And I think what the Congress really intended is that the Medicare program uh, become a benefit for wellness, not just a benefit for sickness. And we have data already to show that, 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 that many beneficiaries are taking advantage of, of these new benefits. Uh, the second new improvement uh, that uh, we, have, we, have, we have implemented starting this year is to close the Part D donut hole that, that Juliet talked about. Uh, the Affordable Care Act over the next 10 years phases down the donut hole in uh, two important ways. Uh, first is starting this year uh, that uh, we, have, we have created and are now operating the uh, drug discount program, which requires brand name manufacturers as a condition of, of being a, a Part D covered drug to offer a, a 50 percent discount point of sale uh, for those beneficiaries that don't qualify for extra help uh, to receive discounts when they're paying for drugs, for, for brand name drugs out of pocket. Uh, the second change that the Affordable Care Act provides the Part D benefit it is to phase down the donut hole um, both for generic drugs and Part D uh, and brand name drugs over a 10 year period. So by 2020, the Part D donut hole combined with the two programs is uh, completely phased down. Uh, already, uh, uh, beneficiaries are benefiting uh, from the changes, um, and so out of pocket costs are down for many beneficiaries. And um, that program is operational. We have secured um, all, all necessary brand name manufacturers as uh, part of the part of the discount program. Um, but beyond the Affordable Care Act, a lot of the work that we have done over the past uh, couple of years and are still working hard to implement is that we have stood up two new payment systems uh, to our to our fee for service program. Uh, Congress, back in 2008, authorized our CMS to create a new bundled payment system for dialysis services uh, to combine both the dialysis fee but also the related drug and uh, lab uh, costs to a single bundled payment. Uh, that change has started uh, January 1st, 2011. 
Um, and we have combined that payment system, and Congress quite wisely, when, when authorizing the program, combined the payment change also with a quality incentive program. Um, so we are also standing up uh, one of the largest uh, pay for performance systems to combine with that new bundled payment system, really to you know to address both the incentives that that Bill talked about to create more efficient um, um, payment, but also to improve quality. And so I think this is a really um, great, um, uh, great uh, model for how we think about payment changes going forward to really th always think about the payment change combined with the quality incentive to ensure that to give more, more stronger incentives for providers to be more efficient, we also uh, think about the quality mechanism at the same time. The second new payment system that Bill talked about is the new DME competitive bid system uh, for nine parts of the country. Um, we have spent the last two years working very hard to, to, to solicit bids, to review bids, to, to approve bids, and starting January 1st of this year for those nine competitive um, bid areas, we are paying much lower prices uh, for certain durable medical um, items. Uh, the average costs are 32% lower on average. That varies by region, that varies by product. Um, but we are extremely pleased um, by the results so far. Uh, we know the program is controversial. We have made compromises uh, to always uh, balance the tension between best price and access. <clears throat> um, but, 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 but so far, um, the data that we have seen gives us great confidence uh, that, that the program is, is working. Uh, I think uh, for this year, um, the things that CMS will be really focused on um, that happy to, again to take um, questions on is really you know going to the Affordable Care Act's notion um, that we need to to build payment systems payment models uh, that promote greater accountability greater quality pay for performance uh, which I think is some of the, the, uh, uh, the most exciting work the agency now is doing um, the first uh, wave of that uh, work is thinking about the Medicare Ad Advantage program. And what's tremendously exciting to me is that uh, for the first time, starting in, in 2012, uh, we are going to be changing the payment system to give stronger rewards, stronger, uh, higher payments to those plans that have a higher quality rating. Um, and that's going to change the dynamic to how uh, plans operate and uh, compete within the Medicare program. That I think today the case is that plans compete based, uh, compete based upon low premiums and extra supplemental benefits. But we're already seeing plans change their business models to focus on quality, to focus on outcomes, to focus on prevention. We, we have a five-star system that focuses both on process measures, outcomes measures, and patient satisfaction measures. And once you turn that into payment, that captures the attention of plan CEOs, their boards, and what's really gratifying to us is in our uh, uh, work, work with plans to hear back, they're changing their business models, they're changing how they market themselves uh, to focus much more on quality, much more on outcomes, and to us that tells us the payment incentives truly matter. Uh, we are also transforming our hospital payment system. Right now, we pay hospitals a higher market basket for uh, market basket update for reporting uh, certain certain process measures, and we have um, um, issued proposed rules to transform that to reward hospitals that have the highest quality and and to create incentives and um, higher payments for those for those hospitals that both achieve high quality but but also th that improve. We're in the comment period uh, to those proposed rules, um, but by 2014, we will be transforming the hospital payment system that Bill talked about to be much more focused on um, pushing hospitals to improve their overall quality and uh, to reward both, both improvement and attainment of quality. Over the next several years, we'll be kind of building upon that framework uh, to propose and to add measures um, to, to uh, we have measures, but to uh, turn into payment, um, uh, hospital measures for uh, uh, preventable re uh, readmissions, hospital acquired conditions, really pushing you know towards the notion that when a beneficiary goes to the hospital, um, that that the, that the Medicare program should reward both the most efficient care, um, but also the highest quality care. Um, the last thing that we are working on and hope to have proposed rules very soon out for comment is the Accountable Care Organization Program. The Affordable Care Act 
um, created what's called the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which, um, which um, creates stronger incentives for physicians and hospitals working with physicians uh, to come into the traditional fee-for-service program and uh, come in and offer to be accountable for the entire fee-for-service benefit um, that's provided to Medicare beneficiaries. Those organizations that, that achieve higher quality, uh, according to CMS measurement, but also reduce the overall cost, according to, to, to uh, CMS measurement, will have the opportunity to, to, uh, to share in those savings. Uh, we are uh, tremendously excited about this program. Uh, the, the law requires us to have it operational by 2012. And so our goal is to create a, a program that will, will encourage lots of different kinds of organizations to come into the program to be an ACO. Uh, but really to change again that, that, that dynamic where uh, providers, physicians, hospitals aren't seeing the Medicare program simply as a bill payer, but they're seeing it as a program that is um, trying to reward better care coordination, better value, more efficiency, higher quality. And so the ACO program will be one overall component uh, to, to the overall strategy. So over the next year, next year, two years, um, and beyond, the work of the Center for Medicare really will be building the payment systems and the, the, the infrastructure, um, both to transform the MA program, but also the traditional fee-for-service program to really be that notion that we want to see of a more efficient, more accountable, um, higher performing healthcare delivery system. And that's the work that we're really excited about um, working on um, over the next several months. So I'll stop and turn to Mark. Terrific, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, finally, we hear from Mark Hayes, who's now a shareholder in the Health and FDA Business Practice Group at Greenberg Traurig, which is a D.C.-based policy and lobbying firm. Most of you probably know Mark from his former incarnation as the Chief Health Counsel for Senator Grassley in the Finance Committee Republicans during the debate over health reform and well before that. Uh, you may not know that he is both a lawyer and a pharmacist, so I guess he can, uh, you know, uh, make sure you get what you need in the way of medications, and then if anything goes wrong, sue the manufacturer. How's that? <laughs> um, Mark, thank you very much. I know it was not easy to clear this in a variety of ways, and we're very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you. Well, first off, I just uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm just speaking for myself today. I'm not here to represent anybody else but myself, and uh, just to speak as a former Hill staffer who has worked on these issues for a long time, and uh, I got the job now of pointing out all the issues and challenges that the program faces, and they are many. So I get the, uh, the really unfun job now to deliver all the sort of scary things that are happening. Um, first, to start off, everybody knows this, but uh, the program long term is, is unsustainable. The Part A trust fund uh, will run out of money somewhere in the window between where those two lines uh, hit the ground. Um, and let me tell you where this data comes from. This is from the CMS Office of the Actuary, and uh, you can find this report on their website. But there are two alternative scenarios here. The, the line that goes down uh, earlier is from prior to the enactment of health care reform. And the two lines going further out are uh, showing a comparison of what would happen post health care reform. So there is just a, a, a big difference that health care reform has on the, the solvency of the program, but I'm going to go underneath that just a little bit to explain what that means. And, and Mark, the, the difference between the dotted line and the solid line on the right is the trustees report from 2010 and the In one an from alternative 20... scenario, which I'm, yeah, I'm going to explain that. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, the health care reform makes a number of changes in payment systems and um, Many of them are permanent changes in the payment systems. And one of the issues that has come up is whether long-term those uh, payment changes are sustainable. And so this chart shows long-term through 2080 what P Medicare payment rates will be relative to private payments uh, in commercial plans and under the Medicaid program. 
And as you can see, Medicare payments relative to those other two payment systems uh, decreased dramatically over time such that Medicare will be paying almost, you know, you can tell almost half of the amount that Medicaid pays today to providers. This is primarily driven by the productivity adjustments to payment rates that are made under health care reform. And what the Office of the Actuary did is looked at this and said, well, this is probably not how this will play out. Congress will intervene in this at some point. So they developed an alternative um, scenario. And that's what the two lines are on the first page, is if you compare those, the dotted line is the alternative scenario, and the solid line is their 2010 uh, projection, the official uh, Office of the Actuary projection. Their projection uh, is based on what's in current law, just the same way that the Congressional Budget Office's baseline is completely driven by what's in current law, even if current law, um, no matter what it says. So some of the things that are in uh, current law and Medicare don't make any sense, like what's happening with the physician payment system. So if you assume that those things are going to get addressed at some point in order to keep the program going, then you end up with this alternative scenario. So then if you look at projected spending and you compare what projected spending was prior to health care reform is the very top line, and you see it going up steeply. The current baseline survey of what payment rates are under current law is the dramatically lower solid line that shows spending leveling out over time. The alternative scenario, however, if you assume that because those payment rates under current law are going down so dramatically compared to uh, private insurance and Medicaid that those get adjusted back up to something that's more uh, aligned with what the trend would be today, then you end up with a projection for spending that's the dotted line, and that's pretty much very close to what it was prior to health care reform. Now, I just point that out just to sensitize you to, um, to this issue, and everybody has to come to their own conclusion about what you think about whether those payment systems should continue at those rates, whether that's uh, policy. Those are your decisions that you all have to make, but you need to be aware of the changes, the effect those changes have uh, going forward to spending under the program and the solvency of the Part A trust fund. Now, switching to uh, a different uh, aspect here, talking about benefit design, this was already mentioned earlier that really the benefit design of Medicare is still pretty much what was written in 1965. Even though benefit design everywhere else has evolved over time, Private coverage has changed, employer sponsored coverage has changed, um, and, and a lot of that is reflected in the Medicare Advantage program, but in the traditional fee-for-service program, you still see uh, benefits that have a lot of gaps in coverage. And as a result, that means that a lot of folks, also as mentioned earlier, have to purchase supplemental coverage. Now here's the issue about supplemental coverage that uh, MedPAC is looking at very closely today. It's in, I think you'll find it in the, the budget options book that CBO just came out with, that when, when uh, supplemental policies erase all of the cost sharing, like a, a typical Medigap policy would do, it drives up uh, per capita spending substantially. And you'll, you'll be hearing more about that from MedPAC, and uh, there was some discussion about this during healthcare reform. This is a big driver of uh, increased spending, and because almost everyone has some form of supplemental coverage, it drives program costs considerably. Okay, another issue, SGR, already mentioned as well, but I want to emphasize it here. This is another piece of the program in terms of in, uh, issues and challenges. You're probably already aware of it. You're, we, if you haven't already had a number of uh, constituent visits and, and mail and phone calls about this, you will. 
Uh, the program has, um, over time, what you have here is the bottom line is what the payment rate should be under current law. The top line is how the payment rates have been increased by Congress in temporary fixes. And what happened along the way in uh, about 2006 is the, um, uh, the methodology for how these one-year fixes were done was changed. So it's made this cliff a really big problem. And for um, 2012, it's really going to be about a minus 30% that if Congress doesn't uh, intervene again, that payment rates under current law go down. That's also something to keep in mind when you look at uh, CBO baselines and uh, the Office of the Actuary baselines. And when you're thinking about current law, it's going to include that 30% cut. You also have something from uh, <coughs> health care reform, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Uh, this is something that gets a lot of discussion uh, today. It really is a, a very unique creation for the program. It creates a, a new board with 15 full-time members who are appointed by the president, confirmed by uh, the Senate. It requires the board to recommend Medicare savings proposals if Medicare spending exceeds certain targets. And what's unique about it really is that these 15 individuals make these recommendations and the HHS secretary is required to implement the board's proposals unless Congress enacts alternative proposals with equivalent savings. So that board will be able to rewrite uh, things that Congress has enacted. So statutory requirements, payment systems, things that Congress has passed can be changed by the Independent Payment Advisory Board, and those things go into effect if Congress doesn't act. There are certain prohibitions that are temporary before 2018 that are uh, sort of off-limits for the IPAB, uh, but those are only temporary, and it's a permanent body. Um, okay. The next really big category of things I want to point out is how these delivery systems, the payment systems, drive utilization. And this is a big issue. Um, the payment systems in Medicare today um, are in many ways based on historical spending, even though the, the, the payment systems have been updated. And they drive huge variations in spending at different parts of the United States. If you haven't gone and looked at the Dartmouth Atlas uh, and you have a, a few hours and you love getting in the middle of data, go to go Google Dartmouth Atlas and look through all of this because it's really important to know about. And what's fascinating is that is in the areas where spending is higher, it turns out that mortality is higher and quality is not as good. You'd think if all that spending was so much uh, was happening, you'd have better quality, but that's not the case. And so that means we've got to look at these delivery systems, these payment systems, and figure out why is this happening. And so this is a quick and dirty uh, sort of overview of how payment systems drive incentives, just to give you a sort of little intro into the thinking behind this. You have fee-for-service systems, which basically say do as much as possible for as many patients as possible. You've got bundled payment systems which say basically don't do as little as possible in as many different settings as possible. So you see patients getting moved from setting to setting because it restarts another bundled payment system. And then you have fully capitated systems which can say do as little as possible for as many patients as possible. So you've got all these different payment systems. They drive different incentives in the program. Um, that is why when you look at these delivery system and payment reforms that are included in health care reform and others that are under discussion, why they're so important, because these payment systems all drive utilization and spending in many ways. I'm obviously not going to go through all of these, but you need to be aware that they are out there. They're just starting out now. John has referenced some of them. And we won't know how well they're going to work until years from now because they, will, they were going to change these incentives and, and evolve over time. But they are they're important changes. And the last thing I want to mention here then is 
that all of these Medicare policies and how they drive spending spill over into the whole rest of the healthcare system as well. So you've got, for example, you've got employers covering 170 million people in the same markets with Medicare. Those Medicare payment systems drive cost shifting to employer plans. The inefficient payment models or these payment distortions drive up costs and, and where they, there aren't sufficient incentives for quality and efficiency improvements, that affects the entire system. So those are things to keep in mind in terms of not only some categories of problems that face uh, Medicare generally, but also the implications that it really has for the delivery system as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Mark. And now you get a chance to ask questions. As Tricia said, you should uh, not be afraid to ask the simplest questions because this is a primer, and you shouldn't be able to uh, you, you shouldn't shy away from the most sophisticated questions because you've got a panel that can handle anything. Uh, the green cards are in your kits. You can hold them up. And as a couple of folks are already demonstrating, there are microphones that you can use to ask your question verbally. We'd ask you to keep the question as brief as you can and to identify yourself. And Hi. here we go. Hi, my name is Steven Spitz. And I'm going to revisit a question that I asked Jonathan Blum last year, and that is what would prevent the drug companies from raising their prices so that when they had a, uh, or they're supposed to reduce it by 50 percent, the baseline is already increased. And I'm wondering what, if any, information you have in terms of what the, the generic, I mean, the, the name brand drugs uh, prices have been since in the, in the approximate year since the uh, Affordable Care Act has been enacted. In other words, have the prices increased substantially and then, you know, 50 percent off of the increased price, or, or have they been relatively leveled? Do you have you studied that at all? Well, here's um, what we can say to your answer. I remember your question from last year, so thank you for <laughs> thank you for asking it again. Then, then it was theoretical. Yeah. Um, CMS's relationship with um, the Part D program is with plans. We don't pay manufacturers, we pay Part D plans who then in turn negotiate with, um, with manufacturers for, for uh, drug formula replacement and uh, the, the ultimate cost to, to beneficiaries. When plans submitted their bids to CMS for 2011, which takes into account they had all the information with the new drug discount program. The, the average Part D bid was lower than what CMS had, had, had previously projected. So the overall cost of the Part D program are, are lower than we had thought this time last year. So we are still seeing a very competitive marketplace. Beneficiaries continue to have choices and to find Part D plans. Um, that uh, provide good value. So um, while CMS's relationship is with Part D plans, our indication is that, you know, costs are, uh, the program continues to manage costs, continues to put downward pressure. The Part D premium is a function of utilization times price. And so from that perspective, we are very pleased. I think it's also important to keep in mind is that, you know, the discount program offers a 50% discount, so beneficiaries are still paying out of pocket, and so that creates creates incentives for manufacturers to think carefully about their um, their uh, pricing decisions. Um, but at the end of the day, our relationships with the Part D plan and the data that we are the, the actual data and the actual payments we are making to plans for 2011 is lower than than we had thought, which is a good good indicator uh, to to address your concern. Very good. Uh, before we go on to the next question, let me just say some of the some of the folks in the uh, state and district congressional offices who are watching the webcast, uh, if you have questions, you obviously can't get them answered in real time. But if you send us an email, we'll try to impose on our speakers to answer the questions if we can't do it ourselves. And you can send that email to info, I-N-F-O, at allhealth.org. Okay. Yes, okay. Eric? Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, first of all, thanks to the Alliance. Um, for those of us who've been working in health policy for several years, it's always great to get a primer, especially from such an expert group of uh, panelists. I have a question about competitive bidding, the issue that 
always seems to keep on giving. Um, it's only been about 10 weeks out since uh, the new rates have been put in effect, but has CMS heard anything from beneficiaries regarding um, access issues or disruption in services? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that we did for both our new ESRD payment system but also our DME competitive system, I think for the first time, is we put in place a uh, tremendous monitoring, claims monitoring program. Um, and it, it sounds obvious that a payer should be able to do this real time, but CMS really didn't have the capability in the past to do this. So I see on a week by week basis um, for our non competitive bid areas the change in claims real time. I mean, we've all, we're only in about our 12th week or so of the programs. So I'm not here to say, you know, we don't have more monitoring to do. Um, but, um, but the data that I've seen on the claims basis gives me great confidence that um, beneficiary access has not been interrupted. We're also watching comorbidities, we're watching uh, changes in hospital use, SNF use, you know, every concern that came to us over the last several years, this could happen, chances are we are monitoring it. We are um, setting control groups for all of our nine comp competitive bid areas, not just for that city, but a control for the next largest metropolitan area so we can compare and contrast use and based upon that data that it gives me great confidence. We also review and have a process in place for beneficiary complaints going into our toll-free number. We have an algorithm that says for every beneficiary that comes in with a question, we, you know, for those that are about access, they get kicked to a case manager right away. They get kicked to a person in our region right away. We have a system to, to ensure that um, beneficiary access is, is first and foremost. That data gives me, again, complaint volume and is incredibly low compared to what I thought it might be. We understand there's concerns about, you know, out there about other complaints. If, if that's true, get them to us so I can, one, see the data, and two, that, that we can respond. But the data we have regarding beneficiary um, access issues gives me great confidence the program so far is going smoothly. Well, that's good to hear, and I'm glad you're monitoring that closely. Just as a follow-up, uh, round two, are you anticipating any delays or changes? as a result of what we've seen so far in round one? Well, I think we are still going through the process to assess round one. Um, we, we have an obligation under statute to expand competitive bid uh, bidding to uh, 91 new parts of the country um, for, for round two. And so we are still going through the, the analysis and the assessment. Um, but based upon what we've seen so far, um, we're, we're confident uh, in our program. Well, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Before we go uh, to the folks at the microphones, uh, so many of you have sent forward cards. We thought we'd try to get a couple of the, them answered uh, and then go on. Tricia? Yeah. Here's a, a nice, good question for 101. How is Medicaid different from Medicare for people with disabilities? I think for that, Juliette, do you want to handle that? Sure. Um, well, um, I think one of the most important things to know about um, Medicaid versus Medicare is that Medicaid covers um, a few benefits that, that Medicare does not. And I think perhaps most importantly, and especially perhaps for the uh, disabled population, Medicaid covers long-term care, um, which is important in, in keeping people um, with disabilities, um, you know, in terms of their health status stable um, and getting them help in, in terms of long-term supports and services. Um, people on Medicare um, who, um, people who are disabled have to get this, uh, certification from Social Security that they have a permanent disability, that they can no longer work. And once they qualify for um, disability insurance, they have to wait 24 months before they qualify for Medicare coverage. Um, so there's quite a gap in terms of people's ability to access health coverage if they have a permanent disability. So Medicaid can, can sort of fill in the gap in that period of time. Once people qualify for Medicare and Medicaid, then importantly, Medicaid will help pay for their Medicare um, premiums and cost sharing, um, the deductibles and the coinsurance that really eliminates um, a lot of the cost sharing burden that other people on Medicare might face. Uh, my name is Mark Kander um, with the American Speech Language Hearing Association. I think this probably is directed to Jonathan, the question about 
uh, DME allowable charges. Uh, we have recently found that, as an example, uh, the cost, the allowable charge for a voice prosthetic um, is about one half the price of what the invoice manufacturer uh, charge is. And I'm just wondering what kind of mechanism does Medicare have to increase these charges? Apparently, for this device, it's been 10 years before there was any uh, increase in that amount. Does, does some outside force have to initiate a data to show that the increase is needed? Um, not sure about the device, and uh, but happy to follow up with you separately. Um, basically, with, with, with durable medical equipment, um, prior to competitive bidding, that the the payments that that, that Medicare makes stems back from um, historical charges trended forward. So we have a to the bill's point earlier. You know, in many cases, not saying about this product, but just in general about DME, uh, we have a distorted pricing system because by statute we have to use either charge history trended forward. So you know. We're paying way higher than we should for some. Possibly could be paying lower than than others. Um, um, but but a lot of it has to do with the statute. But, but let's follow up separately so I can understand more about the product that you're you're describing. Okay, we have a few questions in about the Independent Payment Advisory Board. One person says the Independent Payment Advisory Board cannot recommend proposals to ration care, reduce benefits, increase cost sharing, modify benefits, raise taxes, etc. And there's some providers that are exempt. Um, that sounds like everything. So what is it expected <laughs> to do? Um, I'm thinking maybe Bill and Mark might want to comment on that. Um, there's no question, I think, in addition to the issues that Mark raised about the board um, and, and in terms of, of uh, changing something that the Congress um, has already enacted, the Congress also put a lot of restrictions sort of on the board and gave it some targets in terms of the, the cost um, reductions that it should accomplish. Having said that, I mean, I think there, there are issues about sort of how one can change the structure of Medicare payments vis-a-vis -vis different providers, vis-a-vis -vis different services to try and promote more efficiency. One of the things that Mark noted was the work of the Dartmouth Atlas and the fact that we have these very, very different patterns of care sort of as we move across sort of areas of the country. Um, even within single markets, we know that there's very, very big differences in terms of the patterns of care depending upon which providers that you're using. And so there's a question as we move forward in terms of the effort to, mo to monitor and, and measure quality, can we identify sort of how can we, can we achieve the same levels of quality sort of through fewer services and can we then create sort of payment incentives for both providers and beneficiaries to try and use um, more efficient patterns of care. So that's, that's one sort of mechanism that we can think about. How far this takes us, that's to be determined. Yeah, another thing that, uh, that the IPAB can do is change subsidy amounts. So the, the Part D subsidy, for example, is, uh, is not taken off the table by the IPAB. So even though that would have an indirect effect to increase cost sharing uh, on beneficiaries or you increase premiums, um, the, and while premiums are excluded, it's, it's uh, Part B premium. So if you look at the statute, um, Part D uh, subsidies are not taken off the table. Uh, so that was, and that was something that was de raised during the Senate debate. So there's, there are plenty of other areas in which uh, the IPAB will have authority to make recommendations. And just as a follow-up, somebody's asking, well, um, how about could the IPAP make recommendations um, with respect to physician payments? And um, how about making some changes to the SGR? Why hasn't that happened, other than timing? Because, of course, the IPAP doesn't exist yet. But is there anything to stop the IPAP from dealing with physician payments? Well, there's not. But the problem for the IPAP is they can only really recommend things that reduce spending. And that's their <laughs> purpose. And really, the problem with the SGR, of course, is that uh, physician payments are really in the tank. Now, if Congress were to step in and fix that, then that could place physician payments potentially on the table for the IPAB at some point in the future. But for right now, uh, recommendations to further reduce spending from current law on, uh, on physician payments probably wouldn't work. Okay. 
Unless they wanted to go from 30 to 35 percent cuts. Yeah, that's true. They could they could do theoretically do that. I guess there'd be nothing stopping them. Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Karen Zick. I'm with the Men's Health Network, and I was just wondering what is being done to make people aware of the Welcome to Medicare physical, and why not just set an appointment for it when a person has their first visit with a health care professional with Medicare? Um, I think it's a I think it's a good recommendation. I think we uh, can certainly always do more to. Um, make beneficiaries aware of um, uh, new benefits. Um, we at CMS have a wonderful staff that focuses on beneficiary communications. We use the annual handbook. We use social media so, um, to ensure beneficiaries are aware of uh, new benefits. Um, pr prior to the new wellness uh, benefit coming online, we had the one-time physical um, that not too many Medicare benefic beneficiaries took, took advantage of. Um, but if we can use, not sure we can we have the authority to you know, tell a beneficiary to go to their doctor, but we can certainly use every um, you know, kind of communication tool that we have to encourage um, those, kinds of, um, those kinds of results. I'll give you a specific example. I, you know, I've got two parents who I manage all of their, you know, I don't know how many people are in this situation yet, but at some point you may be where you're you know, helping your, your parents or an elder sibling uh, through health care challenges in their life. And so one of the things I do is manage all of my parents' health benefits and pick their Part D plan and pay all their bills. But uh, I found that uh, Medicare sends uh, notices to uh, my parents to remind them if they, haven't, if they haven't seen a claim for certain preventive benefits as well, just as reminders. So. I was just thinking, as a Medicare beneficiary, I've not seen that yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're well, maybe you're up to date yeah. on all your. Uh, <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> That's true. My wife is probably keeping me up to date. <laughs> uh, uh, question for, uh, at least initially for for Bill, you mentioned in one of your slides the uh, relative value scale update committee, and attributed it to the American Medical Association. I wonder if you could explain how that fits into the official price setting mechanism of, a, of HHS and Medicare? Yes, I mean, it's not that the relative value update committee um, gets to set the Medicare prices, but what, Medi what CMS has done over the years is relied very heavily sort of on an advice coming sort of from the, the, uh, the resource, uh, the, uh, the relative value update committee. It's a group of about 28 physicians. Um, they review sort of different procedures, um, um, each sort of several times a year in terms of uh, whether or not there needs to be a change sort of in the relative values and makes a series of recommendations to um, CMS and then it's up to CMS to actually decide whether or not they're going to be incorporated into the Medicare fee schedule. For I would say probably, and this is kind of, maybe John will correct me, more than 90% of the time, the answer is they do end up sort of being incorporated. Into the I, think, I think that's the old statistic. I think there's some newer statistics um, okay. where we are um, taking a uh, lower rate. Um, and I think the way that CMS currently views the RUC as an advisory um, body to CMS, and I think probably historically there was a case or a, or a, a relationship where CMS was much more passive. We took recommendations, we accepted them, and it really was the rock that drove the, the agenda for which codes to review. And, and we've sort of flipped that around, um, and we have uh, become much more um, uh, much more uh, direct on di direct on a relationship to to uh, to drive an agenda to the rock to. To, to identify codes that we're concerned about, to identify priorities that we're concerned about, misvalued codes, uh, codes that have different sites of serp, or, or, you know, different sites of services with different payment rates, and that's how we see the relationship going forward. Um, this year, we accepted a, a lower percentage of um, the uh, the recommendations, um, but we. Um, have staff who are very active, hands-on with the RUC. They participate in the meetings. They they ask questions, um, and so uh, we, we we see the RUC as helpful to our work. But we see it as a, a relationship that CMS drives the agenda, and that we are um, you know telling the telling the RUC what our priorities are. John, would you say that the result of that more active stance is a 
a shift more toward primary care and away from specialties or in the other direction? There is, you know, there is, um, I mean, I think we are, um, we have an interest to, uh, to drive down, or it's the wrong term, but to correct misaligned codes. We are, we are uh, mindful, and I know the RUC is also mindful that pr the primary care services tend to be undervalued. And that is a huge concern to us, and so that is part of our um, uh, part of our agenda. But but our, but our goal is to make sure that we have uh, the best possible uh, payment system, and that's how we're driving um, our agenda. Do you want to go? Sure, sure. My name is Vince Langman. I'm a nurse from uh, intensive care nurse from Portland, Oregon. And I, your uh, points, Mr. Hayes, about the fee structure, you know, incentivizing. Uh, um, you know procedures and uh, what we do in healthcare. Um, there's a lot of as we can, you know move forward and look at uh, the best. What, what would be some other indicators of health rather than just procedures and you know delivery, but other indicators? I can think of you know body mass index or other comorbidities or there's a quality of life uh, adjusted year scale that measures you know if we do dialysis or person or an aortic valve replacement even on you know someone who's you know, in their 90s can really improve their quality of life. Um, but, you know, working in a surgical ICU, I see a lot of, um, you know, heroics done, and I'm not sure how much it adds to a person's quality of life. So if you could comment on any other, um, what other health measures that we could use rather than just doing more? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for the question. It's a good question because, uh, you know, that slide really does kind of leave you hanging about, okay, so what do we do? And the accountable care organizations, the shared savings program that, uh, that John mentioned that is coming up and running, he may want to speak to this more as well, uh, it's really intended to, I'm pointing at the slide that's no longer here, but it's intended <laughs> to um, fill the gap in between those different payment systems and create a way in which um, payment systems align incentives on cost and quality, which these systems by themselves don't do, don't do today because they're all in silos. So what, what accountable care organizations are intended to do is really be a multidisciplinary, uh, multi-payment setting approach to coordination of care and that those incentives for improving quality are built into the program. So the way that ACOs will work is that if you both reduce spending below what was projected and you maintain or improve quality, then you're going to get to share in those savings. And by doing so, it's intended to get all the, the, the cross-section of providers really around the table together and figure out how to, how to deliver care more efficiently and improve quality from, a, from that whole continuum of care perspective and figure out how to connect the dots better and, and look at just those very kinds of questions that you are uh, raising. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I don't consider myself a quality um, expert by any means, but, um, but, what, um, but what I think our concern that we have with our current quality measures that we use at CMS is that we don't incorporate um, sufficiently the patient experience. So where, where we're trying to go with CMS um, over the long term is it, to incorporate much more uh, direct patient experience measures. What do patients, you know, care about when they are going to dialysis facilities? What, you know, that's that's area that I think all of us need to uh, challenge ourselves to, to develop because where CMS wants to go over time is to have our measures, you know, be about process but also be about outcome but also about patient experience. And that's, that's work that we're trying to push hard on um, so are the quality um, uh, uh, consensus organizations, um, but that's areas where I think we all can do more. So sp speaking of quality, we actually have a lot of quality questions, but this one is about quality on Medicare Advantage plans. CMS has changed the payment regulation um, for quality ratings in MA plans, and instead of paying plans only the highest quality plans, CMS plans to pay all plans with three or more stars, which represents the vast majority of plans and including those with average ratings. Um, John, can you explain the rationale behind that? Sure. Um, the Affordable Care Act um, created a, a payment mechanism where four and five star plans 
um, receive bonus payments that are phased in over a five-year period. And we took a look at the legislation. Uh, we, you know, felt that, you know, d does it make sense for four-star, five-star plans to be um, to be paid the same amount? Um, really what you're trying to do is to kind of make it meaningful for plans to improve. If you're paying the same four-star plan, the same bonus as five-star plan, what's the incentive to get from four to five? And it's also true when you think about sort of how the star system works. And our goal is to create a much stronger incentive um, for two-star plans to get to three, three to get to three and a half, four to get to four and a half, four and a half to get uh, to five. And so um, that was a concern to us of how we uh, think about the incentive structure within the, um, the Affordable Care Act that Congress um, uh, 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 enacted. Uh, we have proposed a, a demonstration, still out for comment, but we have proposed a, a, a demonstration to modify that, that, that structure over three years to create a much more gradual payment, three, three and a half, four um, to five, to create a, a much stronger financial incentive to improve. And when we talk to our actuaries, you know, how they think about this program, it really changes the incentive structure for a plan to focus on how they invest in, in quality improvement rather than just kind of providing that, 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 that extra marginal um, supplementary benefit to a beneficiary. So we are, are testing the, the notion that, that when you change the payment system, you create stronger incentives to improve, and that's, that's uh, first and foremost our uh, policy goal. You've been very patient. Do you want to go next? Uh, my name is Mary Beth Boo Carlson. I'm here on behalf of the MapRx Coalition. Um, my question is for Mr. Blum, uh, and it Wait, is about I the. I have a question for you. What is the MacBarx Coalition? It is a coalition of patient advocacy organizations that have um, come together to continue to be a watchdog group around Part D. Um, my my question um, goes back to CMS's uh, uh, use, I guess, or the ability to, of plans to um, use the specialty tiers in their um, uh, formularies. The call letter, the draft call letter that just came out showed that once again for what will now be the fifth year in a row that the th threshold for drug costs on a monthly basis for those that are able to be put on the specialty tier will be $600. Um, that's five years in a row that that number has been unchanged. And as a result, of course, that means any beneficiary cannot appeal for a lower um, uh, level of cost sharing. And of course, is subject to very high coinsurance. My question is, first of all, how is it that five years we have maintained that same level? And second, what is the methodology that CMS actually uses to determine what that threshold should be? Sure. Well, I think, um, John, could you just explain to somebody what the specialty tier really is? Sure. Um, we allow Part D plans uh, to offer tier cost sharing. Um, the, there's, a, there's a statutory um, benefit um, that, uh, that has uh, a, a percentage threshold for cost sharing, um, but the statute permits uh, plans to offer tiered cost sharing that they're, they're actuarial um, equivalent um, to, um, to that standard benefit that's set by law. Most plans have different tiers to their cost sharing. They'll have one cost sharing tier for preferred generics, one cost sharing tier for preferred uh, uh, brand drugs, and another cost sharing tier for non-preferred drug uh, uh, brand name drugs, really to drive uh, drive um, uh, use towards more uh, more co you know, um, lower cost generic drugs. Um, CMS, when it created the regulations um, for the Part D benefit, also permits plans to offer a, what's called a, a specialty tier. Um, that's a tier for um, very higher, uh, high cost drugs defined through guidance as uh, $600 or, or more. And um, that, that those, those drugs, CMS does not uh, uh, permit beneficiaries to appeal. Uh, to um, to um, uh, lower uh, lower cost sharing tiers. When I got to CMS in 2009, I had the same question that you did: is you know, what is a specialty tier, and is this good for beneficiaries, and is this a good uh, a good deal for 
uh, for our beneficiaries. And I'm convinced uh, that, the, that, that a specialty tier is not a prohibition to, to the use of these drugs, but, but, but encourages access. And if CMS did not create the specialty tier, the concern would be that plans would not cover, not, not cover these high cost drugs. So on an actuarial basis, it comes out ahead for beneficiaries because they get into cost, the, the, the catastrophic benefit. I don't think that I'm convincing you, but um, <laughs> you can, can see it on your, uh, your expression. Uh, but at the same time, and we are convinced that by permitting plans to offer specialty tiers, we actually encourage plans to cover these high cost drugs. And if we didn't, then, then I'm convinced Part D plans would not offer coverage for these drugs. So there's a trade-off. So I think I that folks that are encouraging us to, you know, not not have specialty tiers should think about what the consequences would be on, on Part D plans decisions to cover these drugs. I, I understand your rationale up to a point, but for a lot of um, patient populations that really do not have alternatives that are, you know, in the generic form or, or even in a lower tier, I mean, isn't there? Uh, really sort of a discriminatory nature here of, you know, where where can they go? They have nothing to appeal, you know. I mean, at this point, even, you know, off-label drugs, they're still probably having to cover those um, through their own means. So what what is the alternative for someone who may have multiple sclerosis or, or rheumatoid arthritis? I think you know you know the trade-offs aren't necessarily um, the tier, but the coverage, yes or no, and also the new discount program for specialty tier drugs should reduce the out-of-pocket cost sharing dramatically uh, for for beneficiaries who are on such high-cost drugs. Uh, we are we're not at the end of the time, but we are close enough to it that I would ask you as we go through these last few questions. Uh, that you pull out that blue evaluation form and fill it out so that we can improve these sessions and uh, get you back in here. So with that, go ahead. Uh, a, a quick second question. From uh, Mark Kander, I'm speaking for myself uh, regarding an issue which I thought would be good to bring up here it relates to the fact that I don't know the exact statistic, but a huge percentage of Medicare payments are made to uh, work on a patient during the last year of their life. And I'm just wondering what kind of discussion has been going on to try to change that. I know that Congress would never include the ASU in legislation. Uh, this is a very sensitive issue. But you know, we have so, such access to uh, technical uh, assistance to do for the patient and at great cost. Um, What's going to happen in the future? Oh, I, I beg to differ. Congress did act on this. They put death panels yeah. into the ACA. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the first thing that came to mind. Uh, and but and the reaction we got from the public in an instant. You know, like can't do that. Well, you know, this is obviously a really fraught issue. So I'll dive in unless anybody else, nobody else seems to want to. Um, <laughs> When I got my degree at Hopkins, the president of the hospital at the time said, how do I know when somebody's in their last year of life when someone comes through the hospital door? So, you know, I think what you see in the health reform law is a significant attempt to deal with high need, high cost patients, some of whom may be in the last year of life, but who knows who's actually in their last year of life. But there are a number of little seeds that have been planted, the goal for which is to try to do a better job reducing unnecessary hospital readmissions, for example, for that population, or thinking more um, sensibly about managing the post-acute process. Again, it's not framed around people who, you know, somebody out there says you're going to die in the next year, but the idea is it goes. It's it's trying to target efforts to the very small share of the Medicare population that account for a large share of spending and do so in a way that's designed to kind of eliminate services that aren't needed and to improve the management of care for people who are really high need, high cost. And I think these folks know a whole lot more about this than I do, but in my old days at the House Aging Committee, 
uh, it's my understanding that the percentage of Medicare spending in the last six months of life uh, is substantial, 25 or 30 percent, but it's been unchanged for about 30 years. So it isn't as if we are now hemorrhaging in the, uh, in the program because of these new pieces of technology. Uh, John, am I anywhere close to being right? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. Harvey. And congratulations on a great panel. Let me ask a macro question. We're up, I guess, at about 17% of GNP. All of you are probably going to be asked to go to Congress to talk about debt and deficit. Looking out 20 to 30 years, it's medical costs that overshadow everything, including Social Security. What are you going to talk to them about how to reduce medical costs? And I'm talking about not this next year or even with the uh, implementation of this act. In the next 20 years, what are we going to tell them? And I might add to that question, what are you going to tell them about Medicare versus other health care spending? Well, you know, I think you have a more robust discussion going on right now about these issues than has been taking place for probably 20 years or longer. And uh, what is good about that is that because everybody is focused on these very problems and the really the, the implications they have, not just for the federal budget but for the country, that uh, you have so many proposals that have come out. You've got the President's Fiscal Commission, you've got the Bipartisan Policy Center, you have um, the, of course, Chairman Ryan's proposal uh, on his own, his proposal with Alice Rivlin, you've got the CBO Budget Options book that just came out. So probably more than at any other time that I can think of, there are more ideas and, and suggestions and proposals for how to tackle these problems than, than I think I've ever seen. Yeah, I think you've got to, if you're going to go to the Congress and talk about this, you're going to ask them how many days do they have to talk about it because there's so many dimensions of this that have to be addressed. Um, and it starts, it may start with sort of Medicare and, and um, other public programs, but it also has to include the private sector. Um, one of the things that we are starting to become aware of is sort of how much divergence there is across different markets on the private sector side and the fact that in some markets Medicare is a good payer paying even more than some private insurers. In other markets, some providers are getting 400 percent of Medicare. Um, and this is all a function of markets that, have, that are really not working from a competitive perspective. So that's one aspect. We can't ignore sort of the role of beneficiaries and patients, sort of, that, that they need to have sort of more information, sort of more sense of responsibility in some instances to make sure that they are doing what they can. There's a, there's a whole sort of range of reasons why we are the highest spending country sort of in the world. Um, and kind of turning that around um, is both essential, but so, what an unbelievably complicated task. Yeah. And that has a very high infant mortality, 15 other countries uh, ahead of us, and all a longevity is certainly not as good as many other countries. So we have got this incredible spending, which is just going to go up as more people get uh, live longer, more chronic disease, more drugs, more treatment. And everybody's saying, you know, you've got to get down. 17% uh, is just unreasonable in terms of the amount that you're going to take out of this economy. So it's a big, big problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a question from a physician in the audience uh, who wants to know, given the prospective cuts that loom and keep getting pushed off, uh, and given the fact that the average physician graduates with a debt of 100000 and a quarter with at least $200,000 worth of debt, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you balance compensation being uh, forced downward at the same time that costs are going up, if only to pay off the debt? <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather well, talk about death panels? I know. <laughs> One, there's a premise that in that question that Congress is not going to act. I mean, there's that, that is one sort of factor to take into account. 
Um, at the same time, I think we, sh we need to note that physicians remain sort of the highest paid occupation sort of in the country, that applications to medical school are still sort of more than ample, um, and that the reality is that when you compare debt, physician debt um, to debt for sort of other occupations, the physicians are the one that have the highest ratio of income to their debt of any of the other occupations. So I think that we, we need to think about how do we address this on two fronts. One, it would be very nice to sort of not have the SGR cuts looming sort of over us on an ongoing basis. I mean, both for your lives here in the Congress um, as well as for sort of physicians. Um, at the same time, we have to be looking at medical education and ask ourselves, is this debt all justified or can we make medical education sort of more efficient? Can we think about sort of changing the content within medical, so undergraduate medical education or medical school? Can we change residency programs so that they are, become more efficient? These things, all, I mean, it's again sort of the answer to most of our, the dilemmas that we face is there are multiple fronts that one needs to start to think about pursuing. And are there not debt repayment provisions within the ACA that uh, are intended at least to move us toward greater primary care physician training? Trisha, well, get time for uh, one, more one more question. So this one is near and dear to the heart of um, the Kaiser Family Foundation because it has to do with dual eligibles, and I think Ed, we are going to do another session on dual eligibles. There's a question that, of course, goes to John, which is, what <laughs> is the new federal coordinated health care office for duals doing? But before we get to that, I'm going to turn to Juliet to say, who are these duals? You know, who are dual eligibles? How many are there? What? what why do we care about dual eligibles? Um, well, it's a good question um, because it's an important population uh, covered by Medicare. The um, duals are about 20% uh, of Medicare beneficiaries. There are roughly 8 million dual eligible um, people as um, they qualify for um, Medicaid because they have low incomes. So the majority have incomes um, less than 100% of poverty, which is about $10,000 for an individual. Um, by virtue of their health status, they are um, spending um, more than your average Medicare beneficiary. They have um, a higher rate of chronic conditions. Um, they have a higher rate of um, mental and cognitive impairments. And so this population is generally far more fragile and vulnerable than um, the non-dual eligible on Medicare. And so the Affordable Care Act uh, created or, or directed CMS to create a, a new office within um, to um, bring a team of folks in to help um, identify um, um, barriers to, to better coverage, to um, work with the Innovation Center, to develop novel programs, to uh, better integrate and uh, coordinate care uh, for the dual eligible population. That, you know, there's a long history of of two separate programs, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, providing two levels of service without talking to each other very well, without, without good integration. Um, we have a wonderful director, Melanie Bella, um, who, is, um, who is leading a team, I think about 15 or 20 folks or so. Um, but really their charge is to help bridge and um, um, help identify opportunities for Medicare and Medicaid to work better, to serve the population, to, um, it's a huge cost driver, both both for Medicaid programs, but also for the Medicare program. Uh, just a, a huge issue of just uh, uh, very vulnerable populations falling through the, the cracks. We're looking at all different kinds of models, be it through plans, through better state integration, Medicare integration, provider integration. Um, they, they've also solicited proposals that, that are currently reviewing to for states to bring bring us ideas for ways to. Um, better integrate and uh, care for the dual eligible. So it's a really exciting agenda at CMS, and um, you know, I defer to Melanie on the specifics, um, but she has brought new energy to CMS and to the groups to, uh, to uh, better integrate care. Terrific. Uh, well, we have come to, our, to the end of our time. Thank you for sticking with it. Uh, thanks to our friends at the Kaiser Family Foundation for their multiple contributions to this program. Let me remind you as you scoot out to carry the blue evaluation form completed with you and ask you before you do that, I guess you don't have as many hands as you need to do at all, to join me in thanking our panel for a really elucidating session.